there is a lot which the previous speaker and we share, which is both of us are concerned about knowledge as well as understanding which is not only hermeneutics and religion. So, in New York, you want the mic or is that clear? So, the, if you see that the sometimes there is hermeneutics to a communicative reason. Well, and a bit of explanation on that. The title religion, religion and culture is more indicative of what I am going to present here right now. Uh, the subtitle is meant to indicate that hermeneutics need to be placed in the larger context of communication. Some assumptions with which I proceed that philosophy changes with culture. And most notable change, of course, took place during the modern period. Its significance, if philosophy changes with culture, the significance is that a new, something new emerges as a first philosophy, the, uh, which gives a new perspective on all that is done. For example, the change from metaphysics to epistemology during the modern period, it does not do away with other concerns of philosophy, but it gives a new meaning to the way of understanding metaphysics, especially in Kant. If philosophy changes with culture, it is likely to take the form of a communication theory in the contemporary world. That is the way in which I proceed, and what I am going to present here will be a minor a fraction of that. So, this would be a communication theory if we take diversity of disciplines, cultures, religions as the most characteristic feature of the modern world. And this original insight is coming from a modern thinker, Richard Rorty, American philosopher, though he did not carry through that program. If it is considered a first philosophy, communication does not negate other dimensions of philosophy, but finds suitable ways of understanding and approaching traditional issues in philosophy in a way that is appropriate to today. That is, so this is the background <coughs> within which I will be presenting today and a word of apology to some of my students who are in the course of faith and reason because some of you will be familiar with it but I value this because, uh, because of the other scholars who are present here and others who can ask questions and clarifications as well as come no feedback. Scope of this presentation is very limited. It is to show that communication theory has various dimensions. Hermeneutics as a theory of understanding is an indispensable dimension. Even the single fact about a communication, the indispensability of hermeneutics, makes a great difference to how religious truth is ordinarily discussed in the contemporary world. Some examples of contemporary discussions. I showed a film on stigma. Like any good documentary, it's, it's taken from uh, National Geographic channel. Like any good documentary, it presents various issues regarding the about, about this matter, about chem, how chemistry, psychology, um, believers' position, skeptical position now, and, and the possibility that it may be fraud. All kinds of things are discussed there, various possibilities. I will be focusing only on one thing, that is what is known as the migration of wounds from the farms to the rich, uh, that which happened in the post barbaric period, I shall explain that. Ordinarily, stigma traditionally was in the farms. That from the time Francis was easy, it was known of this, and from the time onwards, that is where stigma always occurred. Pierre Barbe is a French surgeon who hypothesized that Jesus could not have been crucified on the palms, nailed on the palms, for some reasons he gave. And that is, and he published a book on that. So after the publication of this book, some who were familiar with that book and called stigma, the stigma the wounds occurred on the wrist and not on the palm. That was in keeping with what 
Barber um, proposed. So this is a skeptical, joinical, a skeptic, drawn from the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. So he is asking the question. So this is what, what is your one single issue I am taking here. He is asking in that form the question. Why? Why is it, does it migrate or is as if God doesn't know where Jesus was named? It seems to imply that stigma has, stigma has nothing to do with God. Of course, it can be applied generally to religious truth. Now, does this conclusion follow? That is the only thing I have been here. Similar views in, now it is a common, common thing in philosophy. Walter Kaufman's, Kaufman's famous book, Critique of Religion and Theology where he takes St. Paul and St. John to task. He would say about, they are merely catering to the cultural fashion of the day. You know why? St. Paul talks about being all things to all people. Now, to the Jew he speaks one language, to the others he speaks another language, to the Pharisees. So, his last <coughs> statement he is saying, he is just catering to the cultural fashion of the day. He has nothing more to community. Uh, and the implication is culture is a hindrance to truth. Uh, okay, we will say about St. John. He says St. John goes even further than Paul because he was using the word logos from Greek philosophy. It's another matter which also comes from wisdom literature. But he, he uses that word from Greek. So he catering to Greek culture in their life. So, all of this seems to imply that culture is a hindrance to truth. Another person, Philip Kitcher, contemporary philosopher of science. So, he was from the observation that there is a lot of culture in religion, and he argues that religions are cultural products. And all of these implications are similar. But the difference is, Nickel considers culture as a hindrance to truth. Kaufman thinks culture as a hindrance to arriving at a deeper message of the scriptures, which he thinks is from the prophets. Prophet is summons to goodness. Kitcher explicitly says that religious claims are false, if not absurd. Now, against this background, what I am going to argue is that elementary knowledge of communication. We don't need too much. Elementary knowledge of communication, that means here, the principles of hermeneutics, and the dynamics of understanding will enable us to see that these implications do not follow. So this is all I'm going to talk about. What is the basis of communication? This I have taken from who is known as the father of communication theory, communication studies, Will Burstein. All communication involves three elements and two kinds of actions. Three elements of communication, you would say, is the communicator, the message, and an adversary. And two kinds of actions, you would say, the communicator has a message, who encodes it in signs, and sends it across. That's first action. The adversary decodes the message and receives it. Elements of so this is graphically A and B sensing sending it across A sending a message across to B. Same thing here. But this manner of understanding communication is problematic. This is called bullet theory of communication. He says it is problematic. Because successful communication depends not only on the communicator, it also depends on the recipient. This is an insight which is coming to us all the way from Plato, who would say, someone who writes his message is like someone throwing the seeds without knowing where it's being thrown, without knowing the soil. So, which basically means 
Fuller theory of communication does not respect the autonomy of the addressee, the recipient. If somebody cannot show the message. Now, therefore, communication comes to be understood not as fuller theory, but a relational theory. That is, A sends them, A would send the message to B, and B has to respond in the manner that the respondent he knows. But even this relational theory is not adequate because neither A or B are monarchs with living only in the intellect. They come in their own horizon, their own free understanding. Each lives within an encompassing horizon that is different from that of the other. Here I rely more on gas. Each horizon is made up of a different set of accumulated experience, values and prejudices, exposure to ideas and education, and all cultural heritage. Therefore, here now I have placed A and B within their horizons. So, all the three elements of communication, the addressee, the message, and the receive, and the sender, all the three are influenced. They need to be by the horizon. Message arose in the life of A, say, from a particular experience, or something from which he learned, as it becomes, and it becomes a part of the horizon of A. So that's our message. The cultural horizon provides A with the language, the codes, the science that is needed for encoding the message. What is communicated by A is understood by B from B's own horizon. The Shram would give uh, explanations of that in different way with, with, with good examples. I shall I think this is clear enough, so I shall not explain that further. <laughs> Goodness is a communication theory, this another theory specializing in the culture of communication. So he would say rules for interpreting signals is provided by culture. So it makes human communication a doubly mediated process. There is a horizon, mediation through one's own horizon and mediation through the recipient horizon. It's a doubly mediated process. Implication is, since the two actions are independent, they need to be coordinated. And actually another communication theory, Barnard Pierce would say, all communication is about coordinating these two recipient and the addressee. He has the whole thing called form. coordinated management of meaning. So if they are not coordinated, the communication would fail. The task of communication, therefore, is to of that of aligning the source and the destination of the message. One who sends the message and the two, the two need to be aligned with each other. Shram would use the old example of the radio and the transmitter. The transmitter from which the well comes, the radio need to be tuned into the, into that channel. Then what do you receive? Otherwise, it don't take place. How can they be tuned? Is by controlling the two forces at work in communication. What are these forces? First is, I would call it the driving force, which basically refers to motivation. Communication arises from a, a motivation. If we have, otherwise there is nothing to communicate. That is, this is the motivating factor, an overwhelming experience, say love, a religious experience, meeting of a personal need, all of these can give me the, uh, the background, the motivation that leads to communication. Communication theory is often right on Maslow's theory of the hierarchy of needs. In some sense, it is not adequate because Maslow is a typical modern that way, who thinks in terms of individual needs. 
Even when he talk about, talks about relatedness, it is relatedness in terms of my being. In that sense, he is a typical modern <coughs> thinker. Therefore, it needs to be complemented by a sense of fellow feeling for the other, which is not just meeting my needs. So this, this is also, uh, so this is a term considered motivation. This is from another figure who said, the logic of the driving force is deontic logic, sense of oughtness. I must do this. Yet, rather than the logic of easiness, which is Aristotelian form of logic, is mostly concerned with that. So it's the logic of oughtness, deontic logic, rather than logic of easiness. That is, I must say this, or I must write that letter. Communicator now, if once you have the message or a driving force, then communicator becomes like a drawn arrow ready to shoot the message. But in the other, so therefore, driving force is required, motivation is required. But that is not enough. If, if driving force is not there, we can have chatter, no communication, no message. Second is a restraining force. That is, is ready to shoot the message, and yet there is a restraint on how it is communicated. Controlling, guiding, and channelizing the message. Restraint comes from the realization that the addressee is an autonomous other. Someone different from me. And restraint involves a tension between empathy, feeling with the other, and respect for the otherness of the other. So it's a, there's a tension between the two. Result of the restraint is a sense of respectful engagement. And the force of deontic logic shifts from intrapersonal to the interpersonal, from I must change to the other is worthy of the message to be given in a suitable way. Restraining force, a similar tension also is present in the accuracy, one who receives the message. The addressee can understand the message only in terms of her own horizon. But the message has a source which is outside the receiver's horizon. This comes from elsewhere. The, and therefore, what happens? The message has a source which is outside, independently of what the receiver can think of. This implies calling, going beyond one's own horizon and entering into the horizon of the other. <coughs> to return to the first one, accuracy can understand the message only in terms of one's own horizon. What Heidegger, Radamar, would have in terms of projection of meaning. In terms that I can understand, I project onto the message what is there, what I can. Then only I can understand. Only in terms of one's own horizon. And yet, the other, since the message that source which is from outside, I cannot remain content with what I have projected. Now, is it possible to enter into the horizon of another? It is neither possible nor needed to enter into another's horizon by leaving one's behind. Why? Because there is no need to forego one's own horizon to enter into another because there is a, an overlap of horizons. As human beings, there is a lot that we share. Of course, there is, the, there is a theory in the philosophy of science which they call incommensurability, which means there is no common matter, there is nothing in common. But the man who proposed that, Thomas Hume, himself has come to acknowledge, if not for no other reason, at least 
in terms because of our evolutionary heritage, we have a lot in common. He himself has come to acknowledge the third edition of the scientific revolution. Therefore, to talk about incompensability as Rorty and are doing today, or some postmodern do today, is only a dogma. So, possibility of all communication is some commonality between the recipient and the sender of the message. This becomes a point of entry into another horizon. It's a point of entry enables an initial understanding. So in the absence of any commonality, no communication will be possible. Incommensurability would remain. So dynamics of communication, what all of you, know, those who know for the community should know, what is known as the hermeneutic circle. Hermeneutic circle has various meanings, one of which is this various dimensions of belief. So what is the alien message that enters into the recipient's horizon is interpreted in terms of one's own horizon. As I said, the projection. By projecting some meaning into the message from the resources that are available to the address. This is what Gadam would call the fourth project. Shram would give the example. Is there a time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, in that case I shall give up the example. So this interpretation, so what is projected by the recipient become, remains provisional. That my projection is provisional. And which needs to be either confirmed or corrected by encountering the other, which is the communicator, the other, or it could be a text in Garamon. So that encounter is required. And then communication becomes a true and for from process. What in Portugal we talk about inter um, locutionary act. So dynamics of communication then is A and B. A communicating to uh, sending a message, B responding to A, and A in turn responding back. This is a process that continues, through which a fusion of horizon can take place. If the communication goes well, it's not necessary that Garamond does not say this, that uh, uh, what he talks about fusion of horizons, but what he does not say is not all communication ends in fusion of horizons. If we have the, uh, conflict of interest, rather than fusion of horizons, it can also lead to distanciation or distancing of horizons. So if everything goes well, a fusion takes place. Now, so basic things I wanted to say about the meaning of what I said. Uh, there are a lot of more other things which, are, uh, which is not needed for the present purpose. So, implications, I shall point out a couple of them, inter-human communication and divine-human communication. There are implications for both. For inter-human communication, the motivating force, especially for religious communication, in Thomas Aquinas, it is on the purpose of religious activities, preaching, catechesis, theology, is to communicate one's acquaintance with God. This is not the words of Thomas Aquinas, but paraphrase of Thomas Aquinas done by Nicholas Lash. And more generally, you might say the purpose of religious communication is to communicate a religious experience which is seen as exceptional, insightful, something, something to be said and in need of being told to another with a sense of empathy other one is working on this message the result is I ought to tell as Saint Paul said ought to me if I do not preach the gospel Buddha goes from Bodhgaya 
where he got enlightened, all the way travels back to Sarnath to instruct those who were with him before and had left him. I, I want to. And same thing with any of the who were raised by Sri Guru Nanak. So the implication, second implication is in terms of culture. Rules for interpreting intercultural communication comes from one's own culture. Engaging the addressee, therefore, must involve careful choice of cultural elements of the addressee. Otherwise, it results in huge mishaps in communication. This is an example taken from Robert Schreiter. So he talks about the uproar that was caused in Kyoto, Japan, when the image of St. George killing the dragon was installed in the Catholic cathedral. So there was huge uproar when this image of St. George was put up there and people didn't know why. Eventually they came to know is because dragon for them is not a symbol of evil. For them dragon is the symbol of the national, of the symbol of the, 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 the emperor and the national pride. And when St. George, the Christian Dumbukov, is coming and killing the dragon, it means either the Christianity or the foreigners coming and um, subduing their culture. And that's why there was an uproar. So in Japan, Japan, dragon is not a symbol of evil but of the emperor. Therefore, good choice of cultural elements can lead to a fusion of horizons, otherwise it can lead to disasters. And you now if you look at when St. Paul was trying to say have becoming all things to all people, unlike what Kaufman says, he was not catering to the cultural fashion of the day. It's just that St. Paul knew the basics of communication. Okay. As if, uh, okay. so, uh, the internet is the thing I have a bit. And I shall go to, directly to the divine human communication so that I can come back to where I began. Without assuming the existence of God, this much can be said about the divine human communication that if God exists, God is, since God is a non corporeal being, not controlled by space and time, this is a simplification that means. Since horizon arises from the limitations of space-time experience, and God is, if God is not in space and time, God has no horizon. Therefore, divine communication to humans is direct. Except the one who receives it, when we receive it, we receive it in our own horizon. So in Human, inter-human communication is doubly mediated, whereas human, the divine human, human communication is only singly mediated, only one mediation from our own horizon. This is what Karl Anand talked in terms of mediated immediacy. There is A, the receiver, recipient and God is mediated by the recipient horizon and immediate from God. There is only one horizon in God. Unless you understand this, there is something like statement, even before a word is on my tongue, or Lord, you know it all together, Psalm 139. If it is to make sense, it is precisely because He knows us from within, not through the senses, not from outside. What about the skeptical question, this is the one I began with, about the place of the stigma, why did it shift from the palms to the wrist? Doesn't God know where Jesus was named? Why should it migrate to the wrist after Dr. Barbe's book? Three things to consider. First, who gets the stigma? Second, what is the message? And third, how is it received? First, who receives stigma? It's not anybody walking around gets a stigma. Not anyone, but only those who seek to want, become one with the crucified. If you know Francis of Assisi who first received it, 
was is known as second Christ who wanted to imitate Jesus in every way. And those who want with the crucified as an expression of love, recall that Christians believe that the greatest act of divine love was manifested on the cross. And Francis wanted that. And wanting to show the same kind of love to the devotee. So the recipient is someone who wants to receive the same thing, participate in his cross. And by participating in the life of the beloved, by in, in the saving work, as he gracious would their love is shown in actions. Now if it occurs only to those who seek the reunion, what is the message? The message of another. What would be the message? The message would be an affirmation, an acceptance that God has requ accepted my request. That is the message. And given this message, focus on where was he crucified is, is to, uh, you know, to ask the question of that kind is not to know what is what is the significance of it. How would that message be received? The third question. Reception involves belief and understanding. Robert Audi, British philosopher, would say, Belief requires understanding. You paraphrase, sort of imitate, with good sense, and say, whereof one cannot understand, one does not understand, one cannot believe. You say. It requires understanding. So belief is required. So the message, if God has kindly given me the favor of a share in the saving work of the crucified Lord, if that is that is the belief which I come to have. What enables the stigmatist to receive this message? Stigmatist on recognition that what is seen in my body is the sign of the wounds of Jesus. And that definitely requires there can be no recognition apart from the prior beliefs on where Jesus was taken. Given this manner of reception, to focus on where the wounds appeared is to mistake the signal for the signified. In the, in the, this famous imagery, you point to the moon and instead of looking at the moon, you look at your finger. So, <coughs> you ask a question, it's as if God did not know where Jesus was named, completely misfires what the message is about. How to determine his stigmata is genuinely from God? This is not something which I am going to deal with. All that I am going to say is the occurrence in itself is no indication that God has communicated. That requires something more. I have dealt with only with the hermeneutics. There is a lot of other things which is required, which is required in um, communication theory, including um, truth, distribution, things of this kind. that uh, the Judas Iscariot figure was a bad guy. 
And in fact, they thought of him as a kind of hero. And this was because of the cultural practice that took place in their context. Um, later, though, he discovered a way to clarify. And it was through this concept of a peace child that was shared from one tribe to another to alleviate tension. So in order to stop the battle with each other, one tribe's chief would give his own son to the other tribe to be raised by that tribe as a peace child. He considered this a cultural analog man to the, to the gospel, where God gives his son as a peace child. Later he decided he would do research cross-culturally, and he went looking for, and he thinks he found, all these cultural analogs in different mm -hmm. indigenous contexts. And uh, it suggests, if he's right, that there are these shared horizons. But there's the challenge of figuring out where the shared horizon lies. And so his name is Don Richardson, and you may, you may know of his literature on this site already, but um, it's something to, to look at for concrete, sort of empirical study of this possibility. Thank you for such. I'm not familiar with this author, I'll get the name from you. Richardson. Don Richardson. Don. Yeah. Don Richardson. He has a book called Eternity in Their Hearts, because he thinks that God, in effect, is providentially arranged for these um, cultural analogs to appear. George, I have a question about the, the horizon concept you were using there that several philosophers referred to. I, I maybe you could elaborate a bit. Which one? The the concept of the horizon. I have quite oh, about yes, that. Yes, yes. You your the way you had it on the in your paper said that the horizon, uh, the message is interpreted in terms of horizon, right? That's the way you were putting it. Yes. But I would like to suggest that that's partly true. But it's also interpreted in terms of the content of the message. And that the horizon only plays a trivial part in the interpretation. The main part is played by the reality. I wonder if you can comment on that. Uh, the comment, I can. The, this is basically an idea from the hermeneutics of both Heidegger as well as Gaiano. Whatever you understand is in terms of your horizon plays not a minor part, but the main uh, important part because the content in itself, what the subject matter is, you understand only in, in the content is a message. Whatever that is, you can understand it only in the in terms of the resources you have. Just as I say, the cultural thing makes a lot of different first I was talking about the Saint George, Saint George, you know, he talked about the Judas. Well, the message is one thing. The content is there. Of, um, I'm not at uh, the same time, I want to make sure that depending on what kind of interpretation and the meaning is involved. In scripture, for example, the different genres of uh, whether it is a story or a myth or uh, something, all those different things, that they do count. But, how it is interpreted is always in terms of one's own resources. The problem with postmodernism and the what the Hamid does not say, many of them seem to remain there itself. That's why I said the tension between one's own, the fact that I cannot understand only in terms of my horizon, and yet the message it did not originate here. This is from somewhere else. So therefore, I need to clarify with the other, other horizon, which could be another communicator, which could be the available text, which could be other available evidence of all different, different, different things are involved in it. So, um, but the community point of Heidegger and Gehrman stand, all under, and also the Paul River, understanding is always in terms of my own resources. But now the problem with that is, it seems to me, if I just follow quickly, is you end up in relativism. No, that is exactly the point. The point is understanding is uh, as it is a process with the other. Apart from that, I have said nothing about how do you determine the last question I raised. What I understood 
how I understood correctly and what I have understood is in keeping with how, what reality is. These are different issues regarding epistemology to which we need to go into, which I have not done. I have not done here. No, no. Yeah. But uh, that is why it does not end up in religion. Relativism only ends up, which will end up in relativism if I say my perspective, my horizon in the end. Is not. That's only the starting point.